your attendance uh, and honestly I myself am to a degree humbled and honored to be here in this actual panel. Uh, I'm an extremely junior scholar uh, initially from the University of Texas and in this case it again is generally a, a privilege for me to be able to come back and kind of give back to both the University of Texas student body and to the greater knowledge base on Africa. Um, um, beyond that my general interests tend to lie towards um, violence, conflict and the like. And as such, I'm very much looking forward to hosting this panel and to, uh, and to chairing it, simply because it's offering me a significant amount, it has already uh, offered me a significant amount of new perspectives on uh, both regional issues, uh, uh, temporal issues, and even historical issues involved in violence and contestation in various regions of Africa. Um, as such, uh, and simply because, again, I'm simply here to chair, I'm going to go ahead and yield the floor uh, initially to uh, Dr. Mike Adubo Ode, Ode from Benue State University, who is presenting on the tyranny of ethno-religious identities and expressions and the survival of the Nigerian state in the 21st century. Obviously very much uh, a critical issue at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, friends and colleagues. Like you said, the title of my paper is The Tyranny of Ethnic and Religious Identities and Expressions. And the chance for survival of the Nigerian state in the 21st century. I'll be looking at the two sides of several ethnic and religious expressions. The bad sides of those expressions in particular, but first of all, I'll look at the good sides of the religious ethnic expressions and identities in Nigeria. My main problem is how can Nigeria survive in the present century in the midst of so many violent ethnic and religious identities and expressions and achieve in particular sustainable development in this century. Now, the first aspect of the paper by way of introduction says that group and individual identities and expressions are important, they are imperative, because identifying oneself or in groups suggest who you are, where you are coming from, probably what you could die for. So it shouldn't be taken for granted. Many times we express ourselves in form or on the platitude of gender or in terms of religion or tradition in terms of the place we are coming from, our ethnic groups, our political party system, maybe the race or class that we belong. So every time, whether we are conscious of it or not, we are identifying ourselves. For instance, I'm identifying my, like the chair said, he identified me as somebody coming from Central Nigeria, Benue State University. So it is important. So ethnic and religious expressions are very important in particular because they are powerful cultural identities and expressions that are central elements in the hidden agenda of the present world politics. In the Nigerian state, from the first day somebody goes to school to the last day that you leave university, maybe as a first graduate, master degree holder, professor, you are bound to identify yourself somehow, whether in terms of your ethnicity or in terms of your religious inclination. Now, there are three major tribes in Nigeria, ethnic groups rather in Nigeria, Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa Fulani. Hausa Fulani used to be like that, but uh, the, the Fulanis and the Hausas are trying to uh, identify themselves separately. In any case, I can say that there are three major ethnic groups in Nigeria. But on the whole, there are more than 300 ethnic groups and three religious groups, in particular two major ones. Uh, I don't know whether I should say that the African religion is a major one. 
Uh, but Christianity, I mean, and Islamic religion are the two major religions. And people identify themselves according to those ethnic groups or those religious uh, groupings. The important thing here I try to do is that identification along religious lines or ethnic groups, you know, for the most part, move in tandem. And one seem to, to wake up the other as if it is from sleep. And uh, uh, in general, let me shift to the perspective of what I'm trying, or what I did. The perspective on the nature and the character of ethnic religious expression in Nigeria is, I subsume it within what I call the social movement. Social movement are groups that emerge from the beginning somehow higgily piggily. They just emerge because of certain problems under certain powerful individuals. And it could be for two specific reasons, either ideological reasons, which come from social disequilibrium or followers feel that they are alienated from the state system or from the scheme of things and they want to assert their claims ideologically so they use uh, they usually articulate a certain concept which they rally around to achieve certain specific uh, objectives in particular to improve themselves the second one uh, social movement is the, the reason for people emerging in terms of groups to identify themselves as such is for economic reasons, and I think that is most fundamental, which in most cases is for resource mobilization or the hope that after certain identification or emergence or movement of people, they are likely to achieve basic economic uh, gains. I titled that or, or wrote that under the economics of group identities and expressions, which I feel are paramount. So there's always the struggle between those who have and those who have not. And those who have not, economically, try to, to fight to achieve certain objectives to improve their lot in life. And this, I think, is corroborated by uh, sociological and sociological thought. And the conventional tradition, I feel my friend was trying to say I should talk about, of historical materialism arising from the forces of nature and ideas or interests for the same thing which the struggle seems to be, it's always in motion that either it's in terms of ideas or interests or in the nature or in the scheme of things, the haves and the have-nots are always struggling for what I said, like the survival of the species. So, social movements, which I'm rolling ethnic, religious identities and expressions in Nigeria into, are driven by influential, uh, powerful individuals, but they are generally loosely organized, especially in the beginning before they concretize. And you can identify such groups by the, you know, the reasons that bring them together, whether it is mainly for ideological reasons or for purposes of achieving welfare uh, improvement in their welfare system. So ethnic nationalism, religious fundamentalism, civil disorder, and uh, so on, I am trying to subsume under the rubric of what I'm calling social movement. You know, it is like someone expressing something that is very important in a non-civilized manner. Like I said, that it, the, the one good side of such expressions is that you, you, you have to be, so you should express it, you should identify yourself. That is important. But the problem I have in such identities and expressions is that be as important as they are, they are expressed in non-civilized anarchic, tyrannical, disorderly manner. And I think it is a threat to the Nigerian state. That is the center of my argument. So the nature and the character of those religious and ethnic expressions in Nigeria show that there is constant fear of domination between ethnic groups, between religious groups, 
So the tendency is that they are chaotic, they are tending towards tearing the nation apart almost always. For religious groups, they are like, they have unfettered freedom of worship without thinking of the consequences of their actions. And so they represent what uh, Huntington called the clash of civilizations or clash of cultural forces in the world as people struggle for social space. And I think they are very dangerous in the Nigeria state. Stephen Nkom calls this, or regards this as uh, the national question, which revolve around social political uh, issues of integration and the unfinished business, he says, in our national history. That is a quotation from Stephen. So ethnic and religious expressions are also potent factors, powerful weapons, and balancing pull in the power equation in the nation's body politic ready to be used or manipulated over other groups once in a while. Let me get quickly to specific examples of such religious identities and expressions in Nigeria. There are countless ethnic and religious group identities in Nigeria. And one of the major ones that was so explosive, you will recall, is the 1967 to 1970 Nigerian Civil War. The other one, after about 16 years, is the 1986 Sharia OIC, that is Organization of Islamic uh, Countries or States debate in Nigeria. People are expressing themselves along such Islamic lines. Then the, since 2002 uh, Boko Haram incident and the resource control and quest for equitable distribution of the nation's wealth and the population question and the ethnic based agitations rejecting population figures every time, which I think it is like you put it, the game of numbers. So whether in terms of religion or ethnic nationalism, there is endless agitation for one thing or another along those two lines. More specifically, in Kaduna State, there is a running battle between the Hausas and the Zango Kataf, the Biram in Plateau, and the Hausas the Torok and the Muslim communities in Plateau State, the and the Ife and Modakeke communities in Osun State. Such other expressions like as many as 22 in Central Nigeria area between 1989 and 2002. Then to the southeast of Nigeria are expressions between the Ebira and the Okene, the Kaba Okene, Fulani, the Doma, the Keina, I mean, so many expressions along ethnic and religious lines. Those who identify themselves as vanguard of the national um, the national sovereign conference, I mean, uh, to tackle the question of the what income calls a national question. In Nigeria, there is this movement about the national sovereign question, which will take the power from the legislative bodies in Nigeria that look, if Nigeria project, that is to integrate as a nation, is not working, then the National Sovereign Conference could, could as well resolve it. So it's also an identity of the elite in particular. In the Niger Delta, the Niger insurgencies are there. The settler indig indigenous problem is there. And I think, historically, these identities along ethnic lines in particular began about the Second World War period that were explosive in just Plateau. In 1945, between the Hausas and the Igos, that was the first of its kind. It spread to Lagos, to Kano, to Kafancha, to Jos again, and back to Aba in the southeast. Now, of all these, I'd like you to just kindly permit me to talk about in passing because time is almost against me. The problem of OIC, whether Nigeria should be <laughs> the OIC problem, Nigeria is the 46th member of the Sharia debate. In 1978, about 88 Muslims decided to identify themselves as they would not want to talk about the Sharia debate. They wanted the Sharia law to be the rule of law in Nigeria. So 
the Ashon, the Muslims, 88 of them was to walk away from the National the Constituent Assembly. The Matashine uprising of the 1980s, the Boko Haram, like I said, of the 2002 in particular. The two main aspects of my paper are the limits of this violence. And I think they should not be taken for granted because they have damaging effects to the existence of the nation. I say by implication that they are too volatile and serious. And they are counterproductive. And they lack the capacity to accommodate diverse, that is, group interest. Do not take into cognizance diverse interest of other groups, even if they are better for the growth of the nation state. They are driven by tradition, they are narrow minded, and assume ascribe roles rather than higher performance and excellence of virtues for sustainable development. Group interests and identities, ethnic consciousness can only solve limited group interest, not the growth of the nation. So they must be curbed, in other words. And the implication also is the inability of the federal government of Nigeria to curb all this. And if something drastic is not done, I'm thinking that the Nigerian state is waiting to be exploded and that to be too bad. Because like the Boko Haram, like the Zongo Katav, like the Juku, Thief Crisis, etc., are like the Nigerian Civil War of the 1967. If it happens, it's going to be something else. Finally, I will say that too much of a good thing, if it is expressed in an unacceptable manner, uncivilized manner, and tend towards violence is detrimental to sustainable development of the Nigerian state. And so the limits of the identities and expressions lie in their inability to bring about sustainable development in the Nigerian state. And I think there is need for a shift from this. And what to do is to renegotiate, to reconstruct the differences between the groups so that the nation can live in harmony. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> now, whereas Dr. Ode has just spoken uh, very eloquently on essentially the issues involved with uh, uh, tensions between identity groups within a nation and the, the eruptions that have been periodically happening with this, we're now going to move on to an excellent paper discussing the aftermath of a major eruption along these lines. Uh, perhaps the best known one, especially here in the United States, uh, the issues in Rwanda of 1994. In this case, uh, Dr. Bertha uh, oh, I'm, not, I'm a PhD. Oh, well. well I, all right, well, uh, uh, Bertha Kiyotese from the University of Ottawa who will be discussing actually the, the aftermath, the Rwandan survivors' resilience through survivors' associations. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Charles Thomas. Uh, my name is Bert. Uh, I am a, stu a PhD student, PhD candidate at Ottawa University in Canada. Um, before I move into my paper, I would like to explain uh, what I mean, what I understand by resilience. Uh, resilience um, in the literature is um, defined as uh, a capacity of an individual or a group um, to overcome adversity and to go forward in the life. And uh, to be able to talk about resilience, uh, you have to have uh, to be between uh, um, uh, risk, risk factors and protective factors. So in this context, uh, I am talking about resilience of survivors of a genocide, a genocide being a, a, big, uh, a big risk uh, in these cases. Uh, survivors of genocide are mostly uh, left with loss and alone and with a big fear and a huge trauma uh, after that uh, such a big event. Uh, as you have heard uh, in Rwanda between uh, April 94 and July 94, uh, 100 uh, leaves were uh, taken away from from us because I'm among those survivors, um, and in a horrible way, people were uh, killed by uh, machete. People were uh, put into terror toilets alive until they died. Um, so, 
and you count from one to a million. And uh, as I'm here and as I'm a survivor, and as uh, in April we'll be commemorating uh, the 19, 19 years right, after, um, it's not really a matter of number. It's a matter uh, of, of relatives. It is about my parents, it's about my aunts, my uncle, uh, my sisters. And it's not only me, it took one million, but uh, 300,000 uh, survivors had to live in the aftermath of genocide. So how did we manage it? Uh, the first thing, it's we were abandoned not only by our neighbors uh, and friends, former friends of Hutu, but it were, we were abandoned by the whole world. So the first, the first thing was to try to put together a sense of belonging, to belong to, to create new identities. And among new, uh, those new, new identities was creating associations. Uh, the big one uh, being uh, Ibuka. Ibuka uh, uh, in English means remember. And it comes with remember, Ibuka, justice and memory. It's uh, an association uh, created in Belgium in 95 by relatives of victims of genocide. Uh, that, uh, on, under that association, there are many uh, other 15 in Rwanda under that, that one who is like an umbrella. Uh, and how that association uh, helped uh, survivors to become resilient. It's through memory free fighting for justice. Justice is uh, one of the big uh, uh, protective factor to help any victims, not only for survivors, to become resilient. Because through the system of justice, you become recognized. Sometimes it is not a matter of uh, uh, getting money because uh, it's more about being recognized. So the Ibuka fight for justice. Ibuka is there to, to identify in every village who was killed and uh, that person was killed by who. And then to bring that, uh, that to uh, the institution of justice. Uh, during the traditional, uh, the traditional system uh, named the Gachacha, uh, Ibuka was there to to deal with the government. When the government come with Gachacha, because of it had to deal with a big number of perpetrators, they didn't uh, necessarily consult Ibuka, but Ibuka has to come and to say, are you forgiving these people? Is this really will help us uh, uh, to get justice from, uh, from, for our people? So then Ibuka is there to represent other survivors. Um, in the sense of memory, we have uh, a more than 20 memorial seat, and sometimes those sites of memorial uh, have visitors from outside. So they will be a member of Ibuka uh, to explain to the outsider who is coming to visit which happened there. Uh, during commemoration events, uh, uh, which, are, uh, which happen every year, either in the Rwanda or in the diaspora, uh, survivors will have a word. Uh, a cr the crime of a genocide is a crime which silenced people. You are just there to die. So by organizing those events, uh, the survivor have a chance uh, to talk about their stories of loss and then to really become uh, to life. Of course, it doesn't have to be um, an endless process of repeating what you went through. Uh, it is more a matter of um, uh, to get understood and to be recognized, as uh, I said uh, before. Uh, among other associations, there is a, a, an association of widows. So that umbrella has, among other associations, the one of widows, which comes uh, with specific um, Specific, specific problems. Uh, for example, uh, a, among 8% of uh, widows, 
uh, half of, of those women were raped. So they really share a specific, uh, specific problems which they want uh, to share alone, not with the whole uh, group of survivors. The association is more there to take care uh, of, uh, of women who went through genocide. Uh, it's, it was also a way for them uh, to learn how to be without their husband. Uh, before genocide, those women were more depending of uh, their, uh, their husbands, sometimes uh, their children, and some were left alone without any kid. So that association is there uh, to find them shelter and to help, uh, the, to help each other. Uh, another association uh, I would like to uh, talk about briefly is uh, uh, the association uh, of uh, orphans head of uh, household. That one, uh, the widow one was created in 95, but that one of a children head of household came later uh, in 2002, uh, created by one of them, uh, Naftari Ahishakye. And that was the most vulnerable one because it is, uh, um, it is an association of, uh, the members are still young and without parents to look after them, so they have to look after themselves. And that was the big, the major um, problem in the aftermath of genocide. Uh, by existing, by having that new identity as an orphan's head of, uh, of household, uh, the problem was put in the society, and they became uh, the society became more aware of uh, the problem uh, uh, those uh, children was facing, and now uh, there are different association which comes um, uh, to help them in their uh, daily life. Uh, I want to go. More forward, we will discuss with uh, uh, questions. So I just wanted to underline those uh, uh, three associations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now moving on, on, on from that paper, we've so far gone through uh, two papers dealing with clashes of identities, one leading to, to nascent eruptions, one leading to an eruption and the healing beyond it. Uh, this third paper uh, by uh, Mark Reeves of Western Kentucky University, hey, uh, Mfane Goes Home, African Soldiers in the Franco-French Conflict in Gabon, 1940, is interesting because as it isn't simply about the rupture of identities, it's about the rupture of imposed identities in a colonial context, and where and when Africans are stuck between two, col uh, two, identity, uh, two opposing identities of the colonizers, what are their reactions? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, the paper is on your, um, on your table. You can turn those over and let those do distract, but those will help you track along with me in a kind of complicated story. But um, I'm really honored to be here, honored to be up here with you all, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, in the wake of Nazi Germany's defeat of France in June 1940, two rival French governments emerged. The Nazi-aligned Vichy government in France and the British-aligned Gaullist government under Charles de Gaulle. This situation presented a conundrum for France's colonies around the world, namely which government should they obey? Conflict over this question generated profound political divisions and battles in different parts of the French Empire, a conflict I characterize as Franco-French. French West Africa, North Africa, and Indochina all remained loyal to the Vichy government. But despite his vacuous claims to authority, de Gaulle inspired many Frenchmen to rally to him, including in all of the territories of Afrique Equatoriale Française, or AEF, except for Gabon. And Gabon is the territory uh, that you have on your map. After the other territories of AEF rallied to de Gaulle in August 1940, they organized a military conquest of Gabon from September to November 1940. And an interesting episode emerges from the colonial archive of this conquest, that of Marcel Infant, a 33-year-old guard in the French colonial army. During October 1940, the Gabonese town where Infant was stationed, Boué, which is where the, the arrow points to, um, 
was occupied by Gaullist forces, forcing Marcel to decide which French officers to obey. The French officers stationed there previously, or the newly arrived Gaullist officers. In the history of the conquest of Gabon, Marcel's personal decision-making constitutes a rather banal incident. However, the incident has not been examined before, despite offering a rare African voice in a largely European voice narrative. And his case offers us an African voice and a subject voice amid the, the more global Franco-French conflict. His decision-making shows that, at least for one African soldier in Equatorial Africa, pragmatic self-preservation and self-interest shaped reactions to events undermining narratives both of total African passivity or invisibility during the war and narratives using African compliance with various forces as evidence of those forces' legitimacy. This paper focuses on a few junctures where Marcel had the power to decide which French authority he would obey as he received different orders from Gaullist and Vichy officials. And it reveals that Marcel obeyed orders selectively for as long as possible using the space permitted him to pursue his own agenda, showing antipathy for both Vichy and Gaullist French authority. Now, Marcel first encountered the new French government of Charles de Gaulle when Gaullist troops under Lieutenant Debier moved from Moyen Congo, which is currently the Republic of Congo Brazzaville, into his post at Bue in Vichy-aligned Gabon. The Gaullist forces reached and occupied Bue on October 7, 1940. Marcel and the other African soldiers stationed at Bouet saw France's agent spécial, Goudère there, harangue the African soldiers, loudly making known, quote, his sentiments of attachment to the government of Vichy and pronouncing injurious words regarding the chiefs of the Free French or Gaullist movement, end quote. After this awkward welcome, the Gaullist commander completed his occupation of Bouet without incident and replaced the local um, administrator, Fontaine. Goudère, um, the man who had criticized the African soldiers coming in, he returned to his duties promising to be on his best behavior. Now Marcel and other African soldiers must have noted the hostility between Frenchmen and known about the broader conflict among Frenchmen across Gabon. He must also have noted that the Vichy administration at Bouet chose not to fight back except with profanities. Uh, despite having military forces at its disposal. And in this charged atmosphere, the, the ex-chef du département, the ex-regional chief, Fontaine, sent Marcel out on a mission to escort several deserters to Kulamutu, which uh, is on your map, that arrow uh, going down shows where Marcel goes. Um, and in his testimony, Marcel refers to Fontaine, who had been ousted by the, by the Gaullist troops as chef du département, even though he had been ousted publicly on October 7th. But more importantly, Marcel complied with the order, despite Fontaine's apparent lack of power. He'd been thrown out of power. And when he obeyed this ex-administrator, he did so to further his own political, his own personal agenda. And I can say that because Marcel was a native of Gabon, like the other troops stationed at Bouet before it was occupied. And as Marcel made his way back from Kulamutu on October 21st, rather than return directly to Bue, Marcel stopped at a village called Mangaba, where he, quote, found his wife, unquote. That's all it says, that he found his wife. Um, Marcel took advantage of official business to create a window of unsupervised time, which he could use as he pleased, likely aided by the dense equatorial rainforest, where no French officers or colonials dared to venture. He had decided to obey the ousted authority at Bouet in order to create this personal space in the form of his usual trip to and from Kulamutu, because this had been a routine order, creating the time to go to Mangaba and see his wife. Since the order was routine, Marcel had likely used such orders to create a similar personal space before. The Gaullist occupation did not modify that agenda. And another decision point emerged when, while still at Mangaba with his wife, a messenger from Bouet arrived to tell Marcel not to return to Bouet. In this instance, Marcel chose not to comply, saying that I continued my route toward Bouet despite this warning, though he stopped at a village only five hours' walk from Bouet. 
Marcel had obeyed the ousted official who had given him the order to go to Kulamutu, but when presented with an out of the ordinary order, Marcel chose not to comply and to follow his own path instead, returning to the, um, to the town. In the next day, October 22nd, Marcel walked to another village where he wanted to sleep. There he met Emmanuel Aingo, a prisoner of the garrison at Bue and another Gabon native, who worked as a clerk in Gadere's office. Aingo gave him a letter from the French official who had berated the Gaulist forces when they arrived on October 7th. This is Gadere. So Aingo gives Marcel a letter from Gadere. Furthermore, Ango instructed Marcel to deliver that letter to a pro-Vichy French commander who was leading troops from downriver to retake Bouet from the Gaullists. He told Marcel to travel by night in order to avoid being seen, quote, by the guards the new whites led up from Moyen Congo, end quote. After returning with Ango to the outskirts of Bouet around twilight, Marcel waited until darkness and then embarked out toward the column of oncoming French troops. And so at this point, Marcel had been drawn directly into the military side um, of the Franco-French conflict, and he was receiving explicit orders to avoid one type of French authority in favor of informing another type of French authority to help them commit violence against the other type of French authority. And Marcel chose to obey the order this time from the pro Vichy Godère, just as he had obeyed it from Fontaine. And so he was siding against the Gaullists at this point. Now, I think this comes down to the fact that Gudere was a known quantity, um, unlike the newly arrived Gaullists. Moreover, as a native and with longer experience in the environment surrounding Bouë, Marcel would have had no difficulty complying with Gudere's order and avoiding the newly arrived troops. The ease of compliance, more than an ideological attachment to Vichy or to Gudere, explains Marcel's obedience. Now, on October 23rd, Marcel goes as far as Zoanki, which is about 30 kilometers from Bouë, before hearing that the detachment he had been sent to intercept had already turned back and was returning downriver to its post. Apparently, the Vichy force had turned back after hearing that Bouë had already been occupied. So at this point, Marcel, rather than pursue this, this um, group of troops that had been coming toward him, he stays where he is. Uh, probably deliberating over what to do next. We finally noticed that Marcel was not where he was supposed to be. Now, nothing stopped Marcel at this point from following after the soldiers who were moving away from him. If he had wanted to actively subvert the authority of the Gaullist administration in Bouë, he could have done so. So Marcel at this point could choose which French authority to obey. But now his destination was moving away from him. Uh, the troops he was supposed to intercept instead of coming towards him were moving away from him, reducing the ease of obeying his orders from, from Vichy authorities. Presented with this addition to his workload and the burden of uncertainty, Marcel opted to stay where he was. While waiting, he heard that he was being pursued, and so in his testimony to Gaullist authorities after, this event, after these events, Marcel claimed that he did not want to flee, and so he began returning toward Bouë. This news clarified Marcel's options. Whereas he had operated outside of European surveillance since his departure for Kulamutu, the Gaullist administration now was exerting some power in the interest of controlling his actions. By this point, Marcel may have evaluated the personal risks of his choice of authority, having seen Bouet's capitulation without more than words of abuse on October 7th, and then the lack of confidence shown by the Vichy force coming towards Bouet who didn't even, who chose not to even contest Bouet. They, they, they heard it was occupied, and so they turned back. Hence, disobeying the apparently stronger Gaullists at Bouet might produce more dire consequences later than would disobeying the apparently weak Vichy authority. And so he ended up, he got, he got about tw 10 kilometers closer to Bouet before being met by, his, by the man who had been sent to find him, and he immediately surrendered to him. And so they, they stayed in the village where they found each other and then came back to Bouë on the 24th, um, where they were interrogated by the uh, Gaulist authorities. Now from this evidence, Marcel did not make any of these choices out of any particular preference for the Gaulist cause or any political sentiment whatsoever that I, that I can tell. 
Instead, Marcel showed antipathy for both authorities competing for his obedience. On the one hand, he obeyed pro Vichy officials on two occasions, obeying the initial order to go to Kulamutu, even after Fontaine's ouster, and then obeying the openly anti-Gaullist Goudère in his order to take the letter to the troops coming towards Bouë. But on the other hand, he obeyed those Vichy officials selectively, disobeying the order not to come back to Bouë, and then choosing not to pursue the Vichy forces once they were retreating away from him. Moreover, in the end, he chose to comply with the Gaullist authorities. And each of these decisions were guided by relatively apolitical interests, routine, ease of compliance, and personal risk. And each of these then rests on Marcel's own evaluation of his interests and preferences, providing evidence of a small space of autonomy for African soldiers in the tumult of this Franco-French conflict in Gabon. And so just from this one case in the colonial archive, we can see that the simple actions of a soldier like Marcel Enfant represented an amount of autonomy carved out of the chaos of French civil conflict, thank you, uh, but perhaps also present even in peacetime. Hence, more research, especially in local languages and on the ground in Gabon, which I've not had the chance to do, um, are needed to give us a fuller picture of an already neglected episode in the Second World War. And they demonstrate how even African soldiers of, under a colonial state made choices and exploited any window of opportunity to follow their own paths, even if it was just for an evening or two, beyond the regimentation of European colonial control. Thank you very much. Uh, we're down to our last panel speaker, where now that we've gone through uh, eruptions of identity, uh, uh, basically voluntary, involuntary, and now, uh, and now, uh, interestingly enough, uh, anti-colonial or, anti or uh, antipathy towards colonial, we're now moving on into a uh, past conflict into a more um, healing outlook. Uh, that's right. In this case, on oh yes, yes. In this case, on gender and architecture contributions of Nigerian female architects to the built environment. Uh, it should affect what we do in this time. Uh, yeah, and it will come up and see it. I'm going to so. need the professionals to take the cards down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. We got it. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is um, Abimbola Asojo. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota. I'm an architect, and I'm going to talk about gender and architecture and contributions of Nigerian um, female architects to the built environment in Nigeria. So, um, showing to the wrong one. So, I'm just going to. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the um, the Nigerian Institute of Architects was founded in 1960, um, April 1960, about six months before independence, um, by three Nigerian architects studying in the United Kingdom. And, um, you know, by April 2005, I'm going to jump to now because I want to really focus on the female architects in Nigeria. By April 2005, 45 years later, its membership of the NIA was roughly about 4,000, including fellows, full and honorary members, and associate members. But the Nigerian um, Female Architects of Nigeria was founded in 1991 to advocate for women's issues in Nigeria, in architecture. Um, the 1995 edition of the Architects Registration Council of Nigeria, ACON, noted that 80 women were registered out of the 1,383 registered members of the Nigerian Institute of Architects. So in my paper, right, I'm going to show some work of some leading female architects in Nigeria from a period of 1960 to present, and I'm going to highlight some of their built work and some of the contributions of um, Nigerian female architects from 60s to the present, pretty much. So um, just to give you a little bit of overview of um, architecture in Nigeria, um, the, um, early practicing architects. Now, by architects, I'm referring to those, you know, like 
in the US too, that is what is practiced. You know, those who are licensed by like the national body, like the Nigerian Institute of Architects, will be what it is in Nigeria. And then the American Institute of Architects is what it is in America. So technically, you can't call yourself an architect unless you are licensed by that body. It's just like you know, medical doctors when they get their certifications or um, so. Nigerian architecture, you know, the early practicing architects in Nigeria were expatriates, which included some husband and wife teams and some Nigerian architects who studied overseas. And the first set of local architects graduated around independence in 1960. And you find that, um, you know, the female voice is um, very absent in the architectural environment in Nigeria because, um, you know, it's a male-dominated field. Also in America, the female voice is quite absent as well, I would say, because the female-dominated field. I mean, it's a male-dominated field because um, when I got my license in Oklahoma, I was one of, um, actually, I was the first black woman to be licensed architect in the state of Oklahoma, which is very, very interesting. Because originally, I'm, I'm from Nigeria, so it was kind of a shock to me that when I got my license, I was the first black female architect to be licensed in the state of Oklahoma. In America, it's practice based on the state you're from or where you are. So that was an interesting um, discovery. OK, around um, the 20th century that we're early 20th century we're talking about, you know, um, during, um, I mean, independence, architecture was a major, in Nigeria, architecture was a major symbol of progress during independence from British rule. So several skyscrapers, such as the Cocoa House in Ibadan and the Independence House in Lagos were built. Another significant event was the Independence Building, which featured like progressive designs such as aluminum geodesic dome, designed by Godwin and Hopewood, a husband and wife team that founded GHK, which is like a leading architectural firm, which is still in Lagos. And um, Mr. Godwin and his wife, Ms. Hopewood, are like in their 80s now, and they've been practicing in Nigeria since I mean, um, since the 60s, or since, since 1930, pretty much. So in the early 20th century, um, as a result of colonialism and independence, international style <coughs> became very prominent and, um, in Nigerian cities and major Nigerian towns. So you see a little bit of that um, in some of my description. So I'm just going to give you an overview first before I move into some of the four. Um, I'm, I profiled four female architects in my presentation. and. Um, so Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew were husband and wife team. Um, and well, they described a lot of their work in Nigeria as tropical architecture. And some of their significant work can be found at the University of Ibadan, which I show you the trench at all in my image below. And um, in their project, pretty much the Europeans who came to plan practice in um, West Africa or Nigeria, Africa as a whole, in the, in the, you know, in the 20s and the 30s, really designed a lot of modernistic forms, you know, but they try to adapt a lot of their modernistic forms to the um, environmental issues in, in, for example, in Nigeria. Like in um, Trenchador, which is shown up here, designed by Maxwell Drew and Jane, um, Jane Fry, the, the building, you know, uses modern forms. It's an international style building with, uh, it's a white building um, with a lot of, um, sun shading devices and a flat roof. You know, originally, you know, there were lots of louvers and um, um, lots of the facade um, was designed to promote cross ventilation. But the problems that arose, you know, with what, if you design a flat roof in Nigeria, you know, after a while, it starts to leak. So some of those are being rectified now. And they went up, you know, they added some cables to the roof just to let the water run off. So just to show you some of the problems with the international style, buildings that were imported to um, many of the um, African countries. Now, Oluwale Olumuiwa is uh, another Nigerian architect. He was one of the first generation architects born in Nigeria. He was trained in Manchester, but worked in Europe before returning to Nigeria, and opened his practice in Lagos in 1958. He was involved in the formation of the Nigerian Institute of Architects. And a lot of his work, because you will notice, I mean, he was trained using modern idioms. So a lot of his work were like um, influenced by international style as well. And you can see this um, image on the screen, which is um, in Lagos. It's the Oluwale Olumuiwa Architectural House, the one on the top of the screen. 
um, you could see some of the, you know, it, it's ornament, it used minimal ornamentation in these buildings. Because, of course, you know, during the 1920s, international style was the major influence. So the whole idea was, you know, buildings were white, there was limited um, decoration. So a lot of the early um, trained Nigerian architects also, you know, replicated some of those forms in their work as well. So you can also. And this is actually him standing in one of the windows of his um, of the Crusaders' house in Lagos. Okay. Another British architect, Alan von Richards, came to Nigeria in 1955, and he actually designed the University of Lagos, you know, um, Jaja Hall, and which is the image shown. Um, on the screen, and um, you know another structure which has been um, attributed to Alan von Richard is the place structure that was designed in Ikoyi, and it actually mimics one of Eric Mendelssohn's work. You know he used a lot of plastic forms in his design, so you can see some of the influences from you know the European architects in Nigeria. Now, in terms of female voices in Nigerian architecture, so this section or this section of my paper will focus on um, several female architects. And actually, I interviewed, it was like a, um, a study, and I interviewed some of the architects, except Jane Drew, who unfortunately passed away several years ago. So the three um, architects I'm going to talk about, besides Jane Drew, I interviewed them, and um, I'm going to talk about some of my findings. So these female architects were mainly studied in University of Lagos, Obafemi Aola University, which is my alma mater, Great Ife, and Amadou Bello University and University of Jos, um, University of Nigeria, and the United Kingdom and United States, pretty much here. Yeah. Okay, so Jane Drew, which I mentioned earlier, a wife of the English, she was also an architect herself, an English modernist architect married to Maxwell Fry. She was born in um, March 24, 1911. She graduated from the Architectural Association in 1929 and was the first female graduate of the Architectural Association. And after graduation, she refused jobs by many firms. She was refused jobs because she was female. You know, and a lot of, even today, females experience that a lot. We get refused for jobs because it's a male-dominated profession. Most of our work was done in collaboration with her husband, Maxwell Fry, and they have a lot of work in West Africa and in India. You know, she came to Nigeria in 1944 when she was appointed the assistant town planner in Nigeria, which, um, you know, um, colonies of Nigeria, the Gold Coast, Sierra Leone, and Gambia. Um, later in life, when she left Nigeria, she became a full professor in Harvard and um, MIT. Um, she passed away in 1996. And the thing is, you know, I included some of the British there are two British women included in my, um, in my paper because the thing is, you know, you cannot um, take away the contributions a lot of these women have done to mentor a lot of us female architects in Nigeria today as well. So um, Gillian Opwood is also another um, British um, woman um, who has lived in Nigeria since the 50s. And she and her husband actually moved there to um, Lagos and they established the firm in 1955. And um, the firm is GHK, um, Godwin Oakwood, Kuye. And they still are there in Lagos today, mentoring a lot of you know, um, young Nigerian female and Nigerian architects as well. And um, the, they also you know, were influenced by Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew. And, um, they both are sometimes visiting um, professors at University of Lagos and they've written a lot of books on tropical architecture in Nigeria. And they, um, the interesting thing is they also consider a lot of um, tropical and cultural factors in their design projects from time to time. So she is actually a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Architects, one of the very few female fellows in the Nigerian Institute of Architects and she's practiced in Nigeria for 45 years. She was also trained at the Architectural Association in London and graduated in 1950. Um, some of their work, um, some of our work, you know, was in collaboration <coughs> with her husband and um, I think the next slide shows some of their, you know, like the bookshop. You could see a lot of, um, is it full on the screen? You could see a lot of the influences of 
again, you know, the international style influences in their work, you know, like the bookshop house in Marina and um, the school. You know, like I said, this was the beginning of like tropical architecture because they, um, you know, like in um, the buildings that were designed by Le Corbusier and some of the protagonists of um, international style, most of the windows were not operable, there was no cross ventilation, but you find that some of the architects who came to um, Nigeria quickly realized the importance of, you know, um, responding to the climate. Now, the, um, the third architect I'm going to talk about is um, Fola Olumide, who's also a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Architect. She was trained at Ab um, Abandubilo University, and um, she founded Fola Olumide and Associates in the 70s, I was very fortunate as a high school student to be exposed to her when she came to talk at international school in Badon, when I was a high school student. And when she spoke, I decided that I'm going to be an architect. So, and then I was also fortunate again when I was going through architecture school at um, IFE, I, Obafemi Ono University in Ile I was able to intern with her and I worked on, she actually designed the Ascension Catholic Church in Bodija in Badon, which is one of our significant projects, and I was an intern with her in her office. You know, I worked on that building when I interned with her during my internship in 1987. So um, a unique <coughs> picture of our church is that the, even though the Ascension Church is based on the Roman cross, the interesting thing is the sanctuary radiates around the altar. You know, the church is in a pyramidal form, which is, um, different from what you find in, you know, since the church was built to it after Vatican II, one thing you find is that there's a lot of influences from the indigenous culture in the shape of the space because the um, sanctuary radiates around the altar. And then um, another person that I interviewed is um, Cordelia Osashono, who's also a member of the Nigerian Institute of Architecture. She considers herself a rationalist with a postmodern philosophy. She believes in um, the inspiration for projects emanating from cultural context of the project. And I'm just going to go a little bit faster so I can show you some of our work. And this is a block of flag that she did in Ile Ife, you know. Um, and um, let's see, since I have another. Now, another um, architect I found is um, there's a lot of architects who are making a lot of waves in Nigeria, and they're female. Like Rear Admiral Utonu is. Um, she was the first woman to be ranked rear admiral in the history of Nigerian Navy, and I'm proud to say that she's an architecture graduate of University of Nsuka. Since I have a few more minutes there. So there's some other architects that I profiled through my essay as well, and I won't say so much about them, but you know, you know, very, you know, very little information is available on Nigerian women in architecture. So the idea of my essay is just to serve as a starting point for a more contemporary study to look at the contributions of women to Nigerian um, architecture. One thing that my essay would highlight if you read through it is, you know, a lot of their work is influenced by modern idioms, a balance of the arts and sciences, and an integration of vernacular architecture. So um, they're always drawing inspiration from traditional forms and vernacular architecture in addition to the modern idioms or the, um, that they're exposed to. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect. I'm extremely pleased that we actually finished with that paper. We went through essentially ruptures of identity of states of uh, of societies, and we then began working towards the negotiation of those, and then completed on uh, rebuilding construction and the creation of the state and of the urban spaces that people will live in. Uh, well, now we actually have a, a significant amount of time left, approximately, uh, uh, I'd say about 20 minutes, 25, uh, for actually questions from the audience. Uh, we've had four very provocative papers, I think, and four that actually offer a lot of room for uh, exploration and that complement each other quite a bit. So I'd, uh, the only question, the only caveat that I would put on that is, of course, I'd love like everyone to have a chance to discuss their work, so keep the questions within a decent scope. Yes, please. Um. I have two questions. One is the class presenter. Um, in, the, in, your, in your presentation, you said that you talked about some of the things on and the idea about fashion civilizations. 
I'm always worried when people use some of the to talk about African nations just because the idea of African civilizations was pitting the Orient versus the Occident. And that is always very worrying for me because if you use it in the context of Nigeria, what you're essentially saying is that a part of Nigeria could be subsumed with this, within this argument of being the Orient versus the Occident. So I'm thinking perhaps, have you thought of looking at uh, Achille Mbembe and his arguments on post-coloniality and how the post-colonial state has worked, or even Franz Fanon's Rachel of the Art, of which he critiques the elite class as being unable to relate to the masses in their country. So I'm thinking perhaps that may be a different way to go. And then on the second presentation, um, I'm wondering if you've looked at literature on collective memory and collective memory formation. Jeffrey Alexander is big in this. Joachim Sutherland from the University of Minnesota is also a really big scholar on this, and even that kind of talked about it. So I'm thinking, looking perhaps at collective memory formation, if you haven't talked about it, mm -hmm. maybe a good way to show how survivor narratives get carried forward and people remember instances even though they're 10, 14 years removed from the from the original idea. Uh, responses? Yeah. I, my use of uh, Samuel Huntington's uh, phrase, clash of civilization, is to link it to Nigeria as clash of cultures, clash of ideas, clash of interests. Actually, culture or, you know, each ethnic group in Nigeria has its own cultural roots or like individuals. So civilization is culture, in other words. The, uh, so I, I borrowed the phrase to use it in that limited sense of one ethnic cultural uh, leaning clashing with the other one, not the Orient necessarily. That was what I meant. And then uh, your comment about post-colonial state, failure of the, of the elite class. The elite in Nigeria, as elsewhere, they are always interested, if I understood you, they are interested in themselves, rather than the interest of the state. That was what I tried to, to explain. So rather than developing or doing things that will lead to a sustainable development of the state, for instance, to promote what to integrate Nigeria, they are rather taking advantage of, you know, when they are in the political Art. arena or the opportunities at their disposal to rip off the state. Oh, excellent. Uh, uh, any response uh, on your part? Uh, yeah, thanks for the comment. Uh, uh, my paper was not only about memory and remembering, it is uh, uh, mostly how uh, after genocide a small group uh, were born in order to face the consequences of the genocide uh, on educational level and on everyday life. But yes, uh, on memory there is a big literature on Holocaust memory and other genocides. And if I have to do a paper on that, I will go to that literature. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question? Yes. Um, I have a question for uh, Professor Ode. You talk about uh, ethno religious identities, and in your presentation, you presented three major religions. But then, uh, the question is is tradition, indigenous religion involved in this kind of tyranny you express? Uh, has it indigenous religion contributed significantly to the survival of Nigerian states? So, where do you place indigenous religion in your paper? It's not uh, Islam and Christianity because those uh, examples you gave emanated in terms of conflicts emanated from uh, Islam and Christianity. Thank you, sir. Can I ask oh, yeah, please. Yes, okay. Actually, the, the paper 
I presented us in two dichotomies of good civilized, so to say, expressions and violent expressions and identities. And in my presentation, I, I emphasize on the Christian, in particular the Islamic uh, religious group and the violence that is associated with that religion. So to that extent, the role of the traditional uh, religious group in Nigeria or in Africa in general is not violent at all. They play their part, but the most important thing you should, how you should look at traditional religions in Nigeria in this particular regard is that I didn't look at them as being violent, but the essence of it is that they are free and they have always identified themselves as such. The issue is identity and expression. Sometimes the identity is not violent. And my emphasis has been on those that are violent leading to the precarious development or things that are counterproductive to the sustainable development of the nation of Nigeria. Please. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, my question is multiple. Um, and this is my condolences for you all. Um, is identity, and I'm going to address that to you first, is identity or identification of your particular identity really what leads to violence? Is ethnic identity and religious identity what, or what leads to that? Because there are many examples, even within the Nigerian nation state, where Christians and Muslims and traditionalists live in complete harmony. Um, we'll go into states like in Ondo states, where in the same family, people could be Muslim, Christian, and they do not kill each other for religion, or traditionalists within the same family um, and within the same community. Is identity what leads to violence? Because if we look at the situation with not Rwanda, with Somalia, culturally the people are, they, they don't have different religious or ethnic identity, right? And with Rwanda, they have the same religious identity, being majority Catholic. So is it identity that leads to violence, or is it other factors? Because you do mention the elites and things like that, but I think that may be a over, an oversimplification of the situation on the ground. I'm sure not. Yeah, let me see that. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I think, uh, I know that question is addressed to you. Uh, I think it may depend on the context, the context of the creation of that identity. Like in Rwanda, for example, um, the people who were in exile uh, 30 years before genocide created an army to come back home. Mm. But those, for ex those uh, uh, associations of survivors I'm describing, they are, they are fighting for living, but they are not, uh, they are not violent. So I think it depends on the context. Mm. So because, because the way you were dealing with identity, it's like identity, identity in itself is not, is not the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The problem, yeah, it may be the thinking around the identity, but not identity. Because the reason why I say that is like in the US, there is a confusion with nationalist movements that are hate groups, but so survival groups that are protective. And when you start saying that, like the Anti-Defamation League, you want to put that in the same category with like a, the KKK, like some people are trying to do, you know what I'm saying, when you listen to right wing radio, yeah. is the same thing in the context of Nigeria or Africa. And so identity, we have to be careful when we start saying, okay, religious identity, like Islam is leading to violence or whatever, because in Nigeria, in the whole of Nigeria, there are certain factions that may be responsible for these problems. And if you remove religion or even culture from it, these same people will still be violent. And that's why yeah. we need to scheme up and stop getting distracted by religion or culture and try and address the roots of the problem, which is one of the discussions that we haven't even addressed. True. Uh, Dr. Oda, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think that there are exceptions to the rule. The problem is not necessarily identity. And uh, because you say, does identity lead to violence? No. 
I wouldn't subscribe to that argument. But what I was trying to do was to isolate cases of ident cultural, religious, uh, group identities that led to violence and making it difficult for integration in Nigeria. One of the factors that you know, the elite manipulate these groups and manipulate to their advantage is the issue of poverty, which I didn't really have time to talk about. Is the issue of, and, and the poor are always easy, because they are vulnerable, they are easy to manipulate. Because if you have to be in power, you need to, you need to find some means of getting into power. So it's not that identity leads always to violence. And then when Muslims and Christians live together in certain places, not all Muslims are violent, actually. Muslim, yeah, well, that's a sweeping statement, but I don't think that all Muslims are Boko Haram in Nigeria. Aha, uh -huh. so I don't think that all, and in fact, not all Christians are peaceful too. Aha, yeah. uh -huh. so these are issues that I think we can pull through by isolating them carefully. Muslims and Christians living together and they are living peacefully, they are exceptions rather than the rule. Yeah, because right now, any simple thing, look, in, in Joss, where this professor lives, in, in Joss Plateau, and in many cities of Nigeria today, Muslims live in certain sections. No, Wait, I'm, I'm coming. Let me land. Let me land. And certain, and certain roots, and certain roots, and certain places, either Christians live there, or Muslims live there. And you dare not go into those places, like when you say that Muslims and Christians live together. You know, that was what you, I thought yes. you said. Yes, uh -huh. together in those are, I the, think those are... Same street. In my, yeah, yeah but, but, but something else yes, is happening. Too, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, but those are exceptions too. No, 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 I, no, I wouldn't say they're exceptions. In, can I just jump in? In, in Western <laughs> Nigeria. Because, you know, among the Yorubas, you find families where they, the husband is Muslim and the wife is... The, the, yes, the wife, the husband is Muslim and the wife is Catholic, or the husband is Muslim and the wife is even a Pentecostal. I mean, the street where my father's house is in Ibado, there is an allergy opposite the street. His wife goes to redeem church. So, I mean, it's just weird that you're saying it's an exception to the rule. And on the same street, right, there are several allergies and then there are Christians. I mean, I don't know, you I know, think, in Diyak, so that, oh. it's... I would say I think overall we can all agree at this point that uh, identity, specifically religious identity, is a very complex and often yes. complex yes. 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 Uh, thing. And at this point, I, I'm not certain that in the remaining 12 minutes we're going to unravel that all of y'all. And so, yes, please. I, I just have a, a quick comment on that, and uh, my uh, question actually goes to the last presenter. Oh, I, I thought this was a settled case uh, in, at the theoretical level that. Uh, Identities on the, of their own are not conflictual. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the mobilization of these identities that creates the problem. Like uh, they were pointing out, I'm a Christian, my junior brother is a Muslim. Oh. And I'm talking of a real Muslim, not just a nominal <laughs> one. But we, we still spoke today. There's no conflict. It is it's a powerful tool in the hands of elites to mobilize in pursuit of power. There's no question about that. Yes, the point you made is valid because there is acute poverty. It makes the people vulnerable. Yeah. It makes it easy for them to be mobilized in support of extremist ideas and ideologies. It's, it's, it's a straightforward thing. So we cannot give the impression that identities on their own, I mean, creates problems. You know, I, mean, I don't think so. Uh, the architect, great affair. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you, you spoke about uh, the female architects of Nigeria that was formed in 91 around uh, what you call uh, female issues. I thought you were going to address those issues. Uh, I find it difficult to understand the nature of those issues that will make women to yeah. uh, pull out from the uh, mainstream. And uh, you, I guess you should. The other, the other dimension to my question, I also was looking for something that looks like a critique of architecture as it's practiced in Nigeria today. Uh, one thing I have noticed, for instance, and you made a point tangentially though, that there's a lot of foreign influence in the way architects uh, uh, practice their trade. 
that there's a lot of alienation in those buildings that you see all over mm -hmm. the place. Let, take, let's take a great event, for instance. I'm sure you know those lecture theaters around the science faculty. If there is no light, those, faculty, those mm -hmm. facilities are useless. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there must be a critique yeah. of the way we practice architecture. Yes. Yes. OK, so you know, they didn't really pull out. They just formed a whole new section or group to advocate for more female um, architects in the practice in Nigeria. And you find that architecture on its own, even in the US, is a male-dominated profession. I mean, going to school in Ife, I was the only um, female student with, in 92 in a class of 42 guys. So, you know, that tells you, and a lot of my female colleagues or friends that I've met to, it's been the same narrative. So the idea for the organization was to mobilize and encourage more female graduates to come out of the architecture school and practice architecture. Back to your critique, you know, what we're finding is that, yes, a lot of us went through like a Eurocentric um, educational training, and it's only when you get passionate about the importance of um, also giving credit to the unsung architects, like the traditional, I mean, the, the traditional builder who built and who used sustainable principles, who also used different kinds of theories that are not recognized by mainstream, um, mainstream architects. It's only when you find that and you get an appreciation for it that you actually do implement it in your work. Like my presentation earlier in the day, I talked about um, you know, um, traditional influences in religious architecture. You find that architects like Demasuoko, who is a Nigerian architect, who is not even recognized by the Nigerian history of architects. I mean, when he does his buildings, he really introduces some cultural forms and some cultural interpretations in it, even in a house or in a church or in any, um, any um, space that he's designing. So there is an ongoing movement. It's just that in, um, in the architectural profession, you know, there are those who just stick with styles, and then there are those who um, evolve their solutions from the client's problem and also taking into consideration the culture they're designing for and response to what the problems might be as well. But you find that the people who dominate the most are the ones who are focused more on the stylistic movement. So maybe that's why, yeah. I don't know if that. No, thank you. Um, I just want to. Oh, so, sorry, I promised this gentleman earlier. Okay, okay, yes. Yeah, thanks. So the, uh, the, the, uh, my sister from Rwanda. These associations have been on for quite some time now. Yes. yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, considering the, the, the devastating genocide that took place mm -hmm. in your country and the meeting of this association, uh, do you see any traces of hate? Sorry? Traces of hate? And oh. uh, how, how, do you, how do you deal with such issues if they come up? That's on you. I think I, I have a second one for mm -hmm. uh, the architect too. I'm, I'm wondering you, if. You made this, I've heard this in several times, male-dominated profession, politics, this, this, this. And uh, then the female pull out to <coughs> advocate and bring in others. I will not reinforce in this issue of female marginalization. Just a general discussion. Well, OK, is that a question for me? I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's male marginalization, because you know. Uh, no, male dominated. OK, well, yeah, because you, you, are we reinforcing the issue of female? You, it's not just you, but I heard it so many times. This profession, male dominated, this one male dominated. So you pull out of, you say you don't pull out, but you form your own parallel association of one by the side to advocate. It's also part of the NIA. No, it's not reinforcing. No, the male domination and the female marginalization. I think it is very important because even even in okay, like I'm a college professor now, and when I go to even um, architecture um, conferences, there are not a lot of female architecture professors either. So I think it's important for those of us who are female to also mentor and advocate for the younger female to come into the profession. And the more they see the, those female, like for example, I ended up being an architect today because I met Mrs. Kola Olumide. She came to talk in my school. You know, some people will even be surprised whenever I mention a Nigerian female architect from, you know, in the 60s. It's like a foreign language <laughs> to, you know, some of my colleagues, even in Minnesota. You know, so I think it's important 
I think if I answer your question yeah. too, mm -hmm. very, okay. Very uh, quickly, yeah. so I want to get her and then it'll mm -hmm. be you and yeah. Yeah. My question, I mean, um, I think oh, it's, I it's related to his, so oh, I just yeah. want to tie them oh, together. Oh, yeah, so um, I'm interested in what she presented because I'm uh, a volunteer for Nigerian Red Cross. Mm -hmm. And most often we encounter these kinds of things, so I want her to explain a little bit, maybe because we're in a conflict zone, uh, it might help us. Uh, for example, um, the associations that are formed, they are very good. They are for people who are victims to find some form of relief. So I was wondering, I mean, how do they organize them? Um, are they cross-cultural associations or they just based on one ethnic group that believes it is marginalized or people that believe they are victims from all the conflicting sides stay in one camp and organize themselves and so how do they mobilize resources how do they stay in the camp with that kind of distrust and so on Fantastic. That's a great question. That's a big question. <laughs> Thank you for uh, uh, your, your questions. Uh, about hate, uh, you know, I don't think, uh, through speaking, that it can uh, go anywhere now. If uh, before genocide, things look at least okay, uh, Tutsi were discriminated, the school and the public uh, functions, but they were not, uh, Hutu were not killing them, they were living. Uh, almost peacefully together. So I think the genocide has generated the things, but um, the, the willingness of the government uh, to change uh, how things were, uh, help uh, on an official level, uh, helped uh, things to, to be okay. But under the table, uh, people don't love each other, but they, they are not killing each other uh, uh, anyway. Uh, the, the, uh, in 2008, the, the parliament members um, uh, did um, a, a research in schools and uh, to see uh, the ideology of a genocide, if it is still there or not. And um, unfortunately, uh, uh, the results showed that uh, the ideology of a genocide uh, uh, students uh, and writing, oh yeah, it would be good to kill all Tutsi, and if we have uh, a chance, we would uh, kill them again. So under the table is there, and you will find it also uh, it more on the internet. Mm -hmm. On the internet, you will see uh, very strong hate, uh, people talking about each other on uh, discussion forums. So it is there, but on the government level, they are trying to to minimize that, uh, they created uh, um, two years ago uh, uh, the National Commission uh, Against the Genocide Ideology, uh, which is uh, uh, doing a good work. So they are willingness to diminish it, but I don't think it is just not there anymore. Um, how we organize uh, ourselves, uh, that's a, a, big, a big question I didn't go into it, but uh, for example, when Ibuka was created in Belgium in, uh, to, in August 2004, uh, it was uh, uh, people who sit together, uh, who were in Belgium and who lost many members, uh, but who, who had a life, a stable life, and then they created it, and then they helped the Rwandese one uh, to do so, but they were also uh, the help of the government. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think I have a, 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 a good answer to how they organize each other, but uh, I think there are some leaders uh, mm -hmm. who take uh, the first line and then uh, create an association. Yeah, because in Jos, when you say um, victims go and stay in one camp, they mm -hmm. never accept it. And so what we do is, okay, when we're trying to take the, the data for intervention, we say, okay, on this day we're coming to this community, all of you come around a public institution, and most often people will come male and female, then we will say, okay, all females on this line, all males on this line, regardless of your religion. So we observe that the people are talking to themselves, so sometimes we sometimes say, okay, but um, why, why do you, uh, is this a pleasant situation? I mean, so if you are given the opportunity, will you kill someone? 
So we pass those information. But to ask people who suspect themselves to stay, spend one night in one camp, they will never accept. Mm -hmm. Well, I think on that note, I think that this is a fantastic uh, time to, to end the panel. I'd like to thank all my panelists for coming and giving their time and expertise. And uh, hopefully, and obviously, I'm certain any one of them would be more than happy to also talk with you more uh, after the panel as well. So have a wonderful afternoon, and hopefully we'll have another enlightening round of panels, and I'll see all of you at the banquet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.